Welcome back to Golden Black Live. Where there were three, now there are two. Calvin Williams joins me, uh, and we have we were asking Calvin a lot of questions off there. Now I got to remember what those questions were that those guys asked, so we can ask intelligent ones. But Calvin, welcome to the show. Your first experience with a live stream. I know you're going to make it just fine. So <laughs> we're giving you a hard time about being hard. Calvin, welcome and welcome to Purdue. You know, back to Purdue, obviously. As a mm -hmm. Calvin, obviously was a uh, played at, at Purdue in the late '80s, 1986 to '89 on the field. And you also redshirted. Redshirted in 1985. And and, uh, and then obviously a very distinguished career with the Philadelphia Eagles and primarily with the Eagles in the NFL. But Calvin, welcome. And, and uh, tell us a little bit about what your role is now as an assistant athletic director in, in Purdue's athletic department, but what, to, what, are, you, what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities? Specifically, I am in charge of volleyball, wrestling, uh, track and field cross country, and softball. And uh, I'm the administrator. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much like uh, Morgan Burke is our um, uh, top administrator, yeah. and uh, he deals primarily with football. Yeah. Um, in, my, in the same capacity, I have the other sports. So um, just making sure we have, you know, uh, every, everyone's in compliance and, and doing what they're supposed to do. Coaches are, you know, in compliance with the NCAA rules and regulations, and our kids are um, academically um, eligible, and, you know, just make sure programs running uh, uh, smoothly. Volleyball obviously is uh, nationally ranked off to a, a had a huge win last weekend over over Minnesota after beating Indiana in a tough match goes on the road this weekend but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, working with a guy like Dave Shondell who's a very de determined coaches but part of your job is really to to help counsel the coaches and work with those guys as well oh he's a tremendous guy to work with um, he was one of the um, people that I met with uh, when I was going through the process of, you know, hopefully being employed by Purdue. And uh, as everyone knows, he's a legend in Indiana. And uh, his staff is great. Um, uh, it, it's great to work with him. Great to see his enthusiasm, the time he puts in, and uh, just diligent work at um, getting the best out of his, uh, his, his girls. And uh, they do a great job of motivating and coaching, and I think it translates out onto the court. Well, we already have some questions that I want to get to in, in a minute, but also talking about uh, uh, your role with with that and, and having the opportunity. How to, how to, and what what you've been involved with education, involved with other uh, other opportunities before coming to West mm -hmm. Lafayette. How did this whole marriage uh, become rekindled? Uh, coming back to to Purdue, how did this all come to fruition? Well, um, as you well know, Roger Blaylock is um, retiring yeah. in January, and. Um, I had gotten back into uh, sports, uh, didn't really want to coach anymore, but I wanted to get into a more administrative role. Uh, so um, I did an internship uh, with the Texans, and um, that kind of, you know, opened up some doors for me, um, you know, got a few calls, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, it was suggested that, you know, why don't you go ahead and apply for the job I did, and, uh, you know, the guy, ball got rolling, and here I am. How much different is West Lafayette from 1989? Uh, now you may have been, you were back a time or two, probably in between, yeah. but uh, it's a little different community th than it was uh, I mean, 22 years later since your last year. And I, and I know you would have graduated in 1990 from right. Purdue, but you know, a couple decades later, it's a little different community. Has trained, has changed tremendously um, for the better. Um, it's a much larger community, uh, more activities, uh, a lot more to do for the family and I'm excited about that. Um, I jokingly said, you know, I, I never envisioned in my whole life that it would be uh, three Walmarts <laughs> in the town of uh, Lafayette, West Lafayette, Super Target, uh, you know, yeah. Sam's Club. So um, it's a lot to do, has grown a lot. I came back uh, for the spring game two years ago yeah. and I was amazed at the facility upgrades and how the, um, the roads had changed. The yeah. old bridge is now yeah. the bridge that we walk on on yeah. Friday, yeah. you know, so the landscape has changed somewhat. Yeah, it's a three Walmart town. That's a new way of doing it, but I think that's true. It is one of the things that's changed so much. Going back to your playing days, and you played in some phenomenal teams did not have a lot of success, uh, not, do, not necessarily due to what you did. You were a standout player at Purdue, but had some phenomenal games, uh, too, that could come to mind. Uh, and maybe you can relate a little bit to program trying to get over the hump, which Danny Hope's team is trying to do now. Mm -hmm. uh, 1986, your your redshirt freshman year, no one thought that you could beat Indiana, and and you and you bring put on the gold jerseys, jerseys, and beat the Hoosiers. A very happy day for for you. But tell, and then in '89, going down to going down when uh, uh, to Bloomington in a game that no one thought Purdue could win, and Anthony mm -hmm. Thompson on, uh, was going to win the Heisman, and and uh, the Boilermakers. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you scored a late touchdown in that game in that 15-14 win. But tell us about a little bit about not only 
playing here, but what it ta what it takes to get over the hump and 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 keep moving the program forward in the way that it should. I think the biggest thing is you know just playing with confidence. Stacy um, mentioned um, swagger, yeah, and that's what you know that's what I like to you know think of it as. It's, it's swagger. You have to play with confidence, play with some swagger, and know that you can do the job. I think these guys have showed over the last few weeks if they come come to play with confidence and uh, play mistake-free football. A lot of time when you're trying to get your confidence and get some momentum going, I think the biggest thing is playing mistake-free football, especially yeah. when you're playing against teams that on paper are supposed to beat you. And then when you talk about going to the big house, playing in front of 100,000 100, people, you have to play with a lot of confidence and play mistake-free football. Qu a comment or a question from Marshall West Lafayette. Uh, who is the toughest defender you ever played, up, played against? in the league? I get that question all the time and um, you know hands down it has to be Eric Allen yeah. you know because I went against this guy every day yeah. you know so he was uh, one of the best um, you know so um, I think that helped develop me coming in early and he challenged me very early on and uh, you know so Eric Allen without, without a doubt. Another question coming by you know coming from the Baltimore area to Purdue how did you who were some of your final schools that you were looking at before you picked Purdue and and I know you were recruited by Willard Wells and Leon Burtnett's staff, <laughs> but to, to tell us how that process, how does a kid from, from the East Coast make his way to West Lafayette? Well, I was primarily recruited by East Coast schools. Um, you know, uh, University of Maryland had um, dropped out of recruiting me yeah. um, in the later stage. They had guys that were picked higher on their board uh, higher than me. Um, Kansas and Purdue were the only Midwest schools that, that were recruiting me. Um, and, uh, you know, sent in a, a questionnaire back and uh, Willard Wells kept responding to me and uh, the marriage just kind of formed. I fell in love with Purdue upon my visit. Um, I kind of wanted to get away from home yeah. and uh, experience something different. And, uh, you know, it, it was great when I visited here. I um, had a great host and uh, Mark Jass and Steve yeah. Griffin. And, uh, just had a, a blast when I was here and uh, felt like home. And you had some challenges as a receiver in that offense in your, in your playing time. Yes, you had Jeff George your freshman year, but then, you know, Purdue really struggled to throw the football for a while consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had Brian Fox, you had Eric Hunter in your senior year, but both, both those guys were young, learning to play that position. Mm -hmm. How did you keep, you know, here's a guy that you had aspirations of playing, and, and you obviously proved those to be true, but keep yourself uh, uh, from being frustrated in an offense at, at times in 88 and 89, mm -hmm. especially struggled some. I guess you just have to know uh, what your goal is and, and what the mission is. Uh, you know, we did struggle at times, and uh, often when I would see Jeff George when we played against yeah. him, I say, "Man, you cost me a lot of money." <laughs> you know, but um, you just persevere and you get through. I think one of the big things, um, football was great for me here at Purdue, but I think even bigger was the social environment yeah. that made me feel comfortable. You know, I had every excuse to transfer. You know, to go yeah. back home and feel sorry for myself, but I just fell in love with Purdue. Um, you know, we weren't min winning many games, but I was having fun. Yeah. And uh, th that was what it was all about to me, just having fun. Getting my degree was important to me and my family. And uh, I just made the best of the situation when I was here. And, um, you know, um, I think we did okay. You know, yeah. we didn't win a lot of games, but I had fun and we were having fun. You know, a lot of guys, that even in your time, even your redshirt year, but, but when you add in uh, Fred Strickland, Jim Everett, uh, on down the line, guys that, 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 that you saw on, on Saturdays or Sundays in the league, did mm -hmm. you have that? Because uh, we talk now about the, the NFL boilers, the, the Purdue football players that have played in the NFL that kind of have a fraternity. But what's that like to have, have those guys that, you, that you've played college football with and to see them again on Sunday? You may have run into Fred a time or two in the, uh, coming across a uh, crossing pattern, I would assume, in the NFL. Oh, yeah, it's great. You know, as um, soon as you get the schedule, you know, you look at the roster and, you know, you see who from your alumni uh, is, is going to be on the opposing team. And, uh, you know, ran to all those guys, Jim and Fred yeah. when they were with the um, L.A. Rams, uh, Mark Jackson when he was yeah. with Denver and, uh, and the um, Indianapolis Colts. And uh, Rod Woodson, you know, yeah. we played him every preseason when he was with Pittsburgh. You know, and uh, uh, when I was with the Ravens, played against him yeah. again when he was, uh, when I was with the Ravens, he was with the Raiders. You know, so you, you always look for that. Jermaine Ross, yeah. when I was in Philadelphia, yeah. he was with St. Louis. So you all always look for that, and uh, it, it, it makes you feel good that, you know, there are some ballers in the NFL, and uh, you always look for that. What did you learn, and I had a question here on, from someone that about uh, – you had a chance to play under two coaches. You had a transition, certainly, in the, 
a coaching transition after the 86 year, which is tough on kids. But what, yes. tell us a little bit about what you learned playing on Coach Burnett's staff and then also with Coach Aker's staff. What did, they, what did you take from that from a, college, from a football learning lesson? I think the biggest thing for me that I um, learned while I was here, when I first got here, was our offense, my red shirt year, was so dynamic. Yeah. And um, I could just sit back and watch Mark and Steve and Jim, Rodney Carter, Ray Wallace. I could watch those guys work and watch them run routes and, and, and go every day against Chris Dishman and Rod Woodson. You know, so that 1985 year was very instrumental uh, in my development and, and me being a professional athlete because, you know, we, we had so much different uh, offensive schemes uh, once those guys left, but my base had been created and, mm -hmm. and I had learned uh, how to craft my routes and, 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 and learn different things like that. So I think 1985 was a very crucial year for me. You know, you look at the, and I want a question from Keith, and 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 you can all. It, it wasn't that long ago that you were a student athlete here, and that's part of a big part of what you're you're about now is is mm -hmm. being able to relate to the kids. Big news yesterday in the NCAA stipend rule and the, yeah. the two thousand uh, dollar announcement that the, the, that that uh, that can be part of the scholarship now. Your opinion on that, and and, and what uh, and how do you see that playing out for as to benefit to or 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 not so much for the student athlete? I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's a uh, semester. Um, the, the the figure was two thousand dollars. I don't know if that's two thousand. I think it's annual, but I don't know that for sure. So. Yeah, you know, it's. I guess it'll play out to like fifty or sixty bucks uh, a week or something yeah. like that. You know, so I'm not sure how it'll play out. Um, I think it's good. You know, it may hurt some programs who can't afford it or in a financial crunch. You know, so it may benefit more uh, some schools because, you know, that may be a slight recruiting tool. You know, mm -hmm. if a school has a big uh, budget and they can afford it and give it to the kids, fine. But if a smaller school cannot not afford it, it may hurt them. Yeah. When you look at that and you look at the, the value of the scholarship and the fact that it's, a, uh, you know, you can understand debate on both sides of the issue. but. How was your, what was your view, even with Rob Henry's and some of the players making some public comments this week, uh, in terms of that? Was that, uh, you know, in terms of their their public comment about the need for this? Uh, do you think that's a pervasive feeling, or do you think uh, at Purdue, or, and, and is it a big issue? Is it something that you talk about even in staff meetings and that type of thing? I think it, it you know, it is pervasive. You know, not everyone has the same means. You know, me coming from. Uh, a low income situation yeah. uh, back in Baltimore, uh, it would have been very beneficial to me. You know, you don't have uh, the luxury of, you know, getting a few hours in employment during the season because of the restrictions, yeah. you know. So um, I think, you know, if, if you weren't as restricted uh, in terms of how you can work and during the year or during the off season, I think, you know, that could be a situation that, you know, could be a benefit and it'd be less uh, maybe restrictive. But um, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's still some things that need to be worked out because, you know, I think people will try to manipulate it. And yeah. I think it just need to be fair across the board. And uh, I think it's some things that still need to be worked out. Another question we get, at five foot eleven, you were fleet uh, mm -hmm. and that type of receiver. And, and looking at Purdue's, Purdue's receivers right now, what do you see in their in, – and it's a relatively young group, but you have a mix. You know, you have Justin Siller, obviously a fifth-year senior, and and Antavian Edison's been been around some, but but a, a group that's still trying to emerge as a unit. Uh, what do you like from what you see from the from this group so far? I think the, um, in the few short games that I have watched them, um, I think in particular last week, um, them using Siller and the yeah. way they use him, I think was very good. Um, I think last week guys start to step up. They start to play with that swagger. You know, they were catching balls and try to do things with them, um, getting screens and, and making things happen. And, uh, you know, but the first couple of times, uh, first couple of games I saw, it was a, to me, it was a little bit too many drop balls. Mm -hmm and it looked like a lack of confidence, but I think they're starting to get it as a team and as an uh, individual uh, receiver group. The Eagles uh, and, and, and playing professional sports in, in Philadelphia uh, has that reputation. It's, a, it's a, an interesting fan base there, a very passionate <laughs> fan base. Andy Reid's going through some issues this year, a team that was kind of anointed as the, the yeah. team and yet uh, has struggled. Talk about uh, the joy and the scourge of playing in Philadelphia, but also you know how, how seriously they take their football there. Philadelphia is arguably the best sports town, and, and quite often I'm biased yeah. in, in, in the world. You know that's a, a group that they love you, 
and they hate you. Yeah. But the one thing about Philadelphia is Calvin Williams can go back to Philadelphia yeah. right now and they'll embrace you. They never forget you. And uh, that's the one good thing about the uh, sports town of Philadelphia. You know, it's a um, loving city, a um, city of brotherly love. Yeah. <laughs> and they really love you, but, you know, they love their sports. Yeah. And uh, if you're pl not playing well, you know, they're going to let you know about yeah. it. And they're going to let you know about it quick. Yeah. What do you think in your situation, because you, you came <clears> in uh, fifth-round draft pick, you know, you have a very established career and, and, and play, you know, over what seven years in the league. But talk about what it took for you to, to convince uh, in your first year in camp that, hey, you know, I mean business and I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to plan on making an impression, which you did early on in your professional mm -hmm. career. I mean, what did it take uh, for you to get to that level? I think I just fit in with the Eagles, their whole schematic, uh, you know, their mentality, their way of going about playing football. Um, I was a guy, you know, uh, that just like to bump and grind. Yeah. You know, if, if you get in my face, I'm gonna get in your yeah. face. And that was the mentality. Our defense really set the tone for how we were. Um, the other thing is simply just catching the ball. You know, uh, first, second round, you know, you're probably pretty much guaranteed a spot. But after that, you know, you gotta prove yourself. And uh, you can't afford to drop any balls. And, and my thing was, when a ball's up in the air, it's money. Yeah. And uh, that was my motivator. You know, you can't drop any balls. You get fewer, the later you get drafted, the fewer, fewer chances you get, and uh, you have to just make the best of your chances. All right, well, if you're a Purdue fan, which most of you watching probably are, uh, Purdue needs a performance like the Boilermakers did in the fourth quarter at the Big House, 1989, I think, uh, three or four <laughs> touchdowns. Calvin was like running circles around those uh, yeah. Michigan defenders. What do you see from tomorrow? I'm not necessarily asking you from prediction, but what you know, what does it take to compete favorably in the Big House? You've been there, been there and played a couple times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a great experience as a student athlete to do that. Very hostile environment, um, but one you know that I look forward to. I want to play in front of the big crowd, the big stage. Uh, I think the biggest thing for us is to play the way we've been playing the last few weeks and probably even bigger is to play mistake-free football. Yeah. When you're playing against a team that on paper is supposed to beat you, um, I think one of the things you can do um, is play mistake-free football. And then if you play mistake-free, you'll be good to go. I think we'll be good to go. We've got a good shot. All right, Calvin, thank <coughs> you so much. And we'll have you back on, I'm sure, uh, a time or two down the road. We look forward to seeing you around a lot here in West Lafayette and as you, uh, as you uh, get settled here and uh, enjoy your experience in, in Purdue athletics. We'll bring uh, Kyle Charters will replace me and, and uh, also Stacy and Brian will ask, will ask answer that Gary Harris question. I'm sure Kyle will ask uh, Brian that. And then we'll also they'll talk about uh, Big Ten Media Day as well. They'll talk about whatever they want to talk about because I'm going to be gone. So uh, we'll look forward to joining you here. Hang loose for another couple minutes. We'll be back. Thanks again for joining us on Golden Black Live. Just one night. One team victorious. The story behind the score. The rivalries. The big plays. From the sidelines to you. On the air, online. Are you ready for the frenzy? Friday Night Frenzy. High school football from where you live. Check out the Purdue Collection now at Follies. Boiler up with Nike fantastic t-shirts, league and champion fashion colors, simply fabulous, simply Follies. Purdue pride everywhere on game day. Nike sideline worn by the team, by the players, and by you. And make every day game day with tailgate toss. Follies, Purdue pride, a Purdue tradition, 17 game day locations. West Point Steakhouse is a family-owned restaurant known for premium quality steaks. Open for dinner Thursday through Saturday. Stop by for the Thursday night prime rib special or Friday and Saturday night specials like pasta and seafood. Be sure to come and enjoy all the food and fun at West Point Steakhouse. You can now get a quote or buy car insurance 24 hours a day. Call me, State Farm Agent Trent Johnson at 743-9595 and see how much money you can save today. Going to the Purdue game? Stay at Hilton Garden Inn, West Lafayette at the Wabash Landing. Your family will love the well-appointed guest rooms, the pool, Whirlpool, Fitness Center, the breakfast buffet, and the amazing Hilton Garden Inn staff. Located just four blocks from Purdue University, 
Hilton Garden Inn has long been the choice for Purdue fans. Call today for a reservation and make Hilton Garden Inn your number one choice. When you see it happen, report it. Send us your news stories, photos, and videos with our Report It feature. It's easy with WLFI.com and the WLFI smartphone app. With a few simple clicks, you can send videos and photos of breaking news coverage. See your submissions on air as part of our broadcast or online in the Report It gallery. WLFI.com. Always mobile. Always connected. Welcome back to Golden Black Live. Kyle Charter sitting in the uh, captain's chair here, so to speak. Uh, big shoes to fill. I didn't realize, as we introduced Stacy Clarity and Brian Newbert out at the end, that we had a, uh, a, uniform. a uniform. Didn't get the memo. No, huh? I yeah. didn't. Uh, Check your email more. Didn't. Uh, that's what I need to do. Yep. Didn't know the blue shirt. Okay, sponsors to get to. This was my only instruction from Al, was to make sure I uh, read our sponsorships, who we appreciate greatly. Hilton Garden Inn and West Lafayette's Wabash Landing. When tomorrow is a big day, stay at HGI tonight. Also, uh, thanks to State Farm Agent Trent Johnson. Call him at 765-743-9595 or visit him. You know, we could we edit our reads here? <laughs> <laughs> or visit him on the web at trentismyagent.com and also follow its Purdue stores at Game Day Tradition since 1945, the official outfitters of Purdue Athletics. You have a good voice. You, you should do radio. Uh, should I do radio? I It'll so. be amazing if we get through this 20-minute segment without me telling you thanks for tuning in. Or me swearing because Alan's <laughs> gone. That's <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> that would be fun. So you guys were up uh, in, we're in what, trouble. Chicago yesterday? Right? Yes. Yes. Yesterday afternoon. Any, anything happen up there? Um, a bunch of basketball players and basketball coaches sat down at tables and got besieged by um, <laughs> media members. Uh, a bunch of people asked Robbie Hummel about his knee. A bunch of people asked Matt Painter about his knee. Interestingly, I asked Painter after the media day thing was over what the Robbie Hummel's knee question to everything else question ratio was, and he said 70% of the questions. Was it the knee? I thought it was just Robbie Hummel questions. Fair enough. <laughs> Sorry. The I Robbie Hummel question <laughs> to everything else question ratio was about 70%, he said, which surprised me because you would think the how are you going to replace Juwan Johnson and Etuan Moore yeah. question yeah. would take up at least a third maybe of that of right. the total field of questions but apparently it didn't everybody wants to know about Robbie Hummel maybe 90 percent of the 70 percent of the questions about Robbie Hummel were about his knee could be maybe maybe, maybe, maybe that's how that works I know Lewis uh, Jackson and Ryan Smith did say that they got quite a few Juwan yeah. and Etuan questions though so so they, they were saving it for they, the players they weren't left out so yeah. Robbie Hummel first team all Big Ten in the preseason for the third year mm -hmm. I mean uh, big for him I guess but you look at some of those other members of that team and realize maybe the talent that's gone in the conference, right? Yeah, well, it sort of gives it a wide open feel, except for, well, obviously, probably Ohio State. It's kind of a, a transitional year for the Big Ten in the sense that that class of 2007, that was just unbelievably loaded. It had uh, Manny Harris, had a couple of kids went to Illinois, Eric Gordon, obviously the three Purdue guys, Hummel, Johnson, Etuan Moore, obviously Hummels is still there but pretty much everybody else f from that class which has to go down as one of the most loaded classes um, from a single year to come into the Big Ten ever is now gone so there is a little bit of a uh, reloading for lack of a better term just because the Big Ten over the last couple of years has lost so many star power so much star power from that one class yeah. so you're seeing s some guys now have to uh, kind of reemerge as the stars of the Big Ten but in, in terms of Robbie Hummel 
being named first team all Big Ten in the preseason. That certainly speaks to the respect people have for him, just in the sense that people probably still wonder if he's going to re return to the form he was in before. But people are obviously confident that even if he's not exactly what he was before, the substance of his game is enough to make him one of the better players in the conference. And people haven't forgotten about him. You know, I don't know how they could forget about him. We're writing about him every day. All right. But <laughs> it, it's certainly a pretty high compliment for him. I don't know how much it means to him. I can't tell you how many times he must have said yesterday, <laughs> we haven't even played an exhibition game yet. So, yeah. it, it, you know, he'd obviously rather have this after the season than before the season. Well, we welcome your questions. I just realized, however, that if you put your questions up in the, uh, where is it, up to the side here, wherever it is, that I'm not going to be able to get them. So if you have I questions, uh, you can enter them in the chat down below. Can you get them? I think so. Oh, okay, there you go. Uh, we weren't exactly prepared for that. But um, I know that earlier, Brian, there was a question about Gary Harris. And I know uh, you've got your finger on every motion that Gary makes. What's yeah. the latest? Well, the question, the last question that came in addressed Buzz. Buzz that Harris is basically not going any, isn't going to Purdue, which I'm probably taking some liberties with exactly what that Buzz was. But it just kind of illustrates what this has been like. This has been so under the microscope and there's been so little credible information out yeah. there mm -hmm. that if we want to track buzz through the course of the last couple of months <laughs> there's been buzz that he's going to IU there's been buzz he's going to Michigan State there there's been buzz that as soon as Kentucky offers he's going to commit there's been buzz he's committing to Purdue there's been buzz basically everywhere and obviously none of it to date has turned out to be true it could I guess turn out to be true when we find out what exactly happened and maybe if we can find out what was true and when but the likelihood of that happening uh, is probably unlikely I wouldn't anticipate there being any absolutely rock-solid information until that kid has a press conference puts a hat on and tells us all exactly where he's going but I do understand why everybody's so interested as to what kind of chance Purdue has yes I still think Purdue has a great chance when I say great I don't mean they're leading I mean they're right there they have as good a chance as anybody um, so that's I guess my definition of great that's how I've been answering that question for a couple of weeks now but I'm not saying they lead I'm not saying they're getting him but they have a really good is shot. Is it going to come down to a press conference in a week is it going to come down to the ninth well what's he, the I mean is he just going to sign somewhere is, he's taking his official visit to Michigan State uh, right before signing day that's next weekend that's obviously going to be his last visit and then the signing period starts I believe that following Wednesday is it Wednesday? Yeah. Whatever the ninth, the ninth, right? Yeah, the ninth it starts the, the ninth. Yeah. So his last visit is going to run right up to signing day, and it's about 100% certain probably now he's going to sign early uh, as opposed to late, thank God. But <laughs> um, I would anticipate him doing something between the end of that Michigan State visit and the start of that signing period. So you're going to yeah. find out something in that, that brief window of time there. Right. Whether he's going to have a press conference or not, I don't know. I'd have to assume from a sure practicality standpoint, he's going to have to. Right, right. Uh, unless he wants to spend a whole week on the phone talking to people. <laughs> and who wants to do that? Especially you, Certainly, right, right exactly. <laughs> uh, just to Stacey, your impressions of Chicago and, and sort of what you learned up there? I kind of spent a lot of my time bouncing around to the other players on the other, yeah. you know, at other schools and trying to get, get a sense for who they thought the best player in the Big Ten is, the best defensive player in the Big Ten, just kind of trying to get a sense of maybe kind of the over mm -hmm. the overview of the whole conference um it, the thing that was interesting to me was that a, asking these guys you know I, I hit everybody except nebraska because i didn't want to embarrass him him not having big 10 knowledge <laughs> but um <laughs> there was only one men's basketball player from nebraska there and one women's so poor kids were yeah pretty, pretty bored pretty but cable. um it was interesting that you know i think we assume i say we as media jared sullinger was kind of unanimous preseason player of the year, certainly a national player of the year kind of contender, and he was mentioned sporadically by players in his own league. Um, really kind of wide-ranging, Draymond Green from Michigan State uh, got several kind of votes. Um, William Buford's name was thrown out there a couple times, the really kind of dynamic guard from Ohio State. Um, Robbie Hummel, I think one kid threw his name out there too. So I think that's what's interesting. Jordan Taylor of Wisconsin, I think, got one vote. So we're talking about maybe there isn't star power, but there is Balance, maybe, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you have kind of those guys maybe, I, I don't want to say one for every team, but John Sherno is even a guy from Northwestern who is, mm -hmm. you know, could, that first kind of team player. So that was, I think, what was interesting and kind of getting a pulse from around the conference that I think 
I don't think it's a, a an understatement to say that the conference is down this year. Ohio State's better than everyone else, and we'll kind of see how everything filters from there. But maybe there is balance in the sense of at least a player here or there, and that was kind of interesting to Brian, me. Brian, you got Indiana sixth in the league and Purdue seventh. Is that right? <laughs> no, I, I think I, I put Purdue fifth, and the ballot I had to fill out didn't go any lower than fifth, so I didn't fill out the rest of it. But, so what uh, are you saying? <laughs> I, I'm saying don't, don't underestimate Iowa. I think Iowa can be much improved this yeah. year. Don't just automatically stick them at the bottom of the league because they've been bad the last couple of years. It's sort of hard to believe November 1st is the first exhibition, right? And that's Tuesday. Tuesday. Right? Yeah, that's scary. It sneaks up on you, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And the women obviously have a, a scrimmage. Yeah, Saturday. Um, tomorrow. I guess just, did you have a chance to catch I did, up with the women? I today? did talk to a little bit uh, with Brittany Rayburn and Dre Manger were there. I think the biggest thing for, for Rayburn especially is that, and if you, we have senior journey videos that we're doing now on the site um, where I'm kind of taking time with uh, Robbie Hummel, Lewis Jackson, Ryan Smith, uh, Brittany Rayburn, and Dre Mango. Um, Brittany's back and the sciatic nerve has been such an issue for her, especially over the last year, and really kind of limited what she can do. And she's kind of toughed it out and went out there, but she got an injection in her back. And she said that you know her pain was maybe an eight on in scale of 10, and now it's like a two. So I think that's a, that's a big deal and a great sign for Purdue. They, they have some weapons this year, but I think it, it's fair to say that, that Rayburn is a better player when she's not the go-to player. Mm -hmm. And I think that now that if she is healthy and she does feel good, she said her shot's falling, you know, she, she can jump, she can land on two legs. I mean, that, yeah. it, it's a big deal when you're a shooter especially, and she can do some other things too, but to be able to keep that form. So, I mean, if she's healthy, I, that's huge for the women's team who already is going to be pretty good anyway. Right. Just Brian, back to Tuesday. What what do you think you're going to see on Tuesday? What I'm interested in is, is how much is Robbie going to play on Tuesday? What do you think? Ten I think, minutes, twelve, twenty, thirty. I think 30? Painter will be very cautious with him. I think I think Hummel will want to play a lot, especially just because it's going to be so much fun for him to be back out there. Yeah. But I think I don't think there's really any need to put him out there for 25, 30 minutes because he's a known commodity. Obviously, he mm -hmm. knows how to play. Now, what you want to kind of get done in these exhibition games is you do want to establish some chemistry because this is a very different team. That They are going to have to play a very different way. So these exhibition games are probably a little bit more important this year than they've been the last two or three when you've had that yeah. same team, that, that all that continuity built up, where you knew exactly how you were going to play, you knew who was going to be playing. But with what's going on right now with the team is you wonder how much Robbie Hummel is going to play just because Painter is not going to want to um, ask too much of him too quickly. You also wonder how much Lewis Jackson's going to play. Uh, he's got the issue with his foot and his ankle, and yeah. he's been uh, held out of some practice. Um, so it'll just be interesting to see how he balances trying to get his guys out there with trying to be smart with some guys who've got some, got some issues right now. Stacy, just quickly before we move back to uh, football, everybody mm -hmm. likes to talk about starters and, and who the starters were going to be. Just what are your thoughts on who will be out there for on Exhibition Tuesday. 1 for the men? I think it will be interesting. We've talked a little bit about this. Is is the center spot and yeah. with Sandy versus Travis Carroll? From what we hear, Sandy looks really good in practice for the most part. You know, maybe some consistency issues, but the way that he can rebound and the physical presence he brings would be huge for them. So that I think is interesting. Otherwise, I don't think there are any surprises, right? I mean, we know Barlow will be at the yeah, three. You know, Ryan Smith is at the two. We've got four Rob and, and Lewis. Yeah. So so I think really it's kind of that five spot. So I think Travis is. Even last year, you know, when he was a freshman, he was steady. He mm -hmm. was sound. I mean, he was really a heady player, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he can hit that, you know, kind of baseline jump shot and kind of do those maybe be more versatile than kind of what Sandy is. So maybe there's just a mixture that they kind of experiment with and, and see how that works. I think starting lineups this year are a little bit less important than they've been in the past. Not that they've, they're ever terribly important. You know, coaches always say yeah, it's not who starts, it's who finishes. But this year he's going to have a lot of flexibility with his lineups because – if you want to go small, you could put Hummel out there with DJ Bird next to him. You could put Hummel out there with Donnie Hale next to him. If you want to go big, you could put Sonny Marchouche at center. Yeah. Your biggest player, put Hummel next to him. And it won't be as bad a matchup as it would have been last year because when you had Juwan Johnson and Sonny Marchouche out there, out there together, you didn't have the skill. You, had, you basically had th only th three guys on the floor who could – who could pass and handle and whatnot. Now when you get Robbie Hummel back, you can s surround Marchuch with some other guys who can make decisions and whatnot. And that's what, that's what Painter always tries to do. He tries to win those matchups because he's going to have a lot of skilled guys on the floor. You can do that more this year 
than you could last year. So I, one thing about this year, I could see them in certain situations going very small, whether that means Barlow at the four, uh, DJ Bird at the four with Hummel technically playing the five. I don't, he's not a center by any means, but he might have to defend the five against certain matchups, maybe like a Cody Zeller or somebody like that. So, you know, he's going to have a lot of flexibility this year. So, you know, the starting lineup just might not be all that important. Back to football, and we'll get our predictions, I suppose, here in just a minute. But uh, recruiting coming pretty close to an end here, I would imagine, with only a few spots left after Purdue got the defensive end uh, yeah. earlier this week. Just what, what do you see? How do you see this thing wrapping up? Well, it would have to be just about over yeah. uh, with the addition of Greg Lotta last week, the junior college defensive end. They're at, I think, 21 commitments now. And, you know, scholarship availability is always a moving target because guys leave, guys enroll mid-year and whatnot. So it's just, it, it's always hard to tell exactly how many spots a team has, but you can't have that many more than 21. So you figure they're probably down to the last three or four. You're still looking at probably defensive end as a spot they really need help at. Uh, they're still recruiting running backs like they're going to take a running back. They're still recruiting all sorts of players all across the board. So, But the position that would really stick yeah. out was you probably need more defensive ends. In particular, someone asked about Dion Bush. Anything you think, or just does that ship sail? Yeah, I mean, his top five are Purdue, Alabama, Auburn, Florida yeah. State, I believe Miami. So uh, I think LSU is in there too, not that that's, that's any better, but, you know. All due respect to Purdue, but you've got a Florida kid with everybody in the country, including everybody in the SEC, wanting him. It's just just hard to see them getting that done. All right, All right prediction time. Who you got tomorrow? Michigan, 24-21, I believe is what I had. Any any thoughts behind that, or is that? I, I thought we were done talking about football. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, and I think a lot what kind of Brian and I had said earlier. I really think it's a it's a game Purdue could go and steal, mm -hmm. um, but. You know, and Michael was talking about it when he called in, too. We're talking about Purdue's confidence and all that, but Michigan is coming off of a game that they're, like he said, they're going to be hungry, they're going to be upset, they're going to be ticked, and they're playing at home. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's just kind of that mix of two teams that maybe feel like they can win. Obviously, only one can. Brian, your prediction in 10 words or less? 28-17, um, um, Michigan. That's, this just seems like a team that's much more uh -oh. fundamentally sound that's than past Michigan teams and just kind of finds a way. You know. Yeah. They, their defense gives up yards, but doesn't give up a whole lot of points. It just seems like they always kind of find a way. I've got Michigan 31-24. I think Purdue has a chance if they can force Denard to throw and turn it over. So I think that's it, right? We wrapped up. We ready to go? We're good. All good. Right. Uh, just a, again, a thanks to our sponsors, Hilton Garden Inn uh, in the Wabash Landing. Also, State Farm agent Trent Johnson and Follett's Purdue stores as well. And thanks to... Everyone at WLFI for helping us out. That includes Gordon Jackson, Kim Caldwell, Patchy Smith, and Baron Brindle. And for Alan Karpik and uh, these two yahoos over here, I'm Kyle Charters. Thanks for tuning yahoos. in. Yahoos. And also thanks Brian to West Point Uber. Steakhouse. And West Point. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I forgot. Who's <laughs> saving you? Yeah. I'm the co-host. I'd, I'd quit getting all the free food over there. West Point Steakhouse is a family-owned and operated quality restaurant known for hand-cut, premium quality choice steaks, just a short drive from Ross State Stadium as well. Thank you. Uh, I've got some personal sponsorships I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> Bring out the cup. I'd like to thank Nike. All right. <laughs> See, the music's playing in my ear. We're out of time. Thanks for listening to, uh, what's the name of the show again? Golden Black Live. Supermarket Suite. <laughs>